Welcome to another edition of the Conversations Podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by Shoshana Berger and BJ Miller. Shoshana Berger is Senior Editorial Director at IDO, where she has worked on projects ranging from the end of life to modern Judaism. She led the launch of IDO's publishing platform and of Blueprint, its first large-scale conference. Before IDO, Shoshana was a Senior Editor at Wired, and wrote for the New York Times, Fast Company, Time, Wired, and Quartz. In her 20s, she co-founded the DIY Design Magazine, later turning into a book ready-made, How to Make Almost Everything. Dr. B.J. Miller is a longtime hospice and palliative medicine physician and educator. He's been on faculty at his alma mater, UCSF, since 2007, and has worked in all settings of care, hospital, clinic, residential facility, and home. BJ's career has been dedicated to moving healthcare towards a human-centered approach, on a policy as well as on a personal level. Led by his own experience as a patient, BJ advocates for the roles of our senses, community, and presence in designing a better ending. Next to birth, death is one of our most profound experiences, BJ and Shoshana write. Shouldn't we talk about it? prepare for it, use what it can teach us about how to live. When it comes to death, we're all beginners. That is why BJ and Shoshana co-authored the book A Beginner's Guide to the End, which is a cleared eye and big-hearted action plan for approaching the end of life, written to help readers feel more in control of an experience that so often seems anything but controllable. In this episode, we dive deep into what we can learn from this collective pause we currently are living in and putting these newly acquired insights into practice. We discussed the importance of revisiting our own nature, one that includes mortality and emotions. Why is it important to have a conversation around death and how to have them with oneself and with others? We also talked about the ways in which we can foster a sense of community in an atomized society. Talking to Shoshana and BJ has been one of the most amazing experiences ever since I started this podcast. I'm very honored and grateful with BJ and Shoshana for joining me in a deep conversation. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. I'm here with BJ Miller and Shoshana Berger. It's just a tremendous honor and a great opportunity to, to be with you here during these crazy times, at least. Uh, as I as I've mentioned a lot of times in previous interviews during my lifetime, I've never been in in this context as many of us haven't, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity for having you. Thank you, Alex. So just to start off, um, I'd like to ask both of you, who, whoever wants to start, how would you introduce yourself to your younger self? Mm. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> who who wants to go first? I can jump in because I have a daughter, a young daughter who's 13, and I'm often just caught staring at her and marveling that she exists at all. And recently I've gotten so excited for everything that's in store for her, what's ahead of her, all of the mysteries of life, falling in love. Mm -hmm. traveling, discovering new things, discovering things about herself and about other people. And I think what I would say to my younger self then, knowing that I have this kind of reverence for her youth, is understand that everything is open to you right now. Everything is, every door and every window is open. And you choose where you want to go. And we've tried to give you everything you need to give you the strength and the wisdom to do that. She thinks she's awfully wise and she knows very little. <laughs> so that can be dangerous with great power comes great responsibility. But I think I would say just understand that everything is open and it's going to be thrilling and heartbreaking and just let it all in because that's all a part of it. I think I was not, uh, the heartbreak was felt like such a big way to fall to me that um, maybe I didn't take quite as many risks 
as a younger person that I as I could have. So that's it. <laughs> well, BJ, well, that's hard to follow. Um, <laughs> mine is more. I think my answer is just sort of straightforward, which is like, yeah, hey, you know, <laughs> that way you feel right now, you're going to always feel that way. <laughs> that that person you are now, that's going to be you. And like, get used to it. Start working with it. You're not going to become someone else. And that's wonderful and horrible. Take both ends of it and work with it. You know, something like that. Because I feel so much internally, so much the same person. And mm. I, I realized as I look back, I kept away like, oh, maybe next week I'm going to become something else or different or change or get out of this, these shoes. Or, and of course, the sooner you kind of accept your shoes, then the sooner you can start walking around in them, running around with them, playing in them. So yeah, something like that would be my letter. Wow. Both me as a, as a 21 year old, just hearing this, both of you say the things that you say. And for, for, on one hand, I remember the story that, that BJ shares about, about the snowball and about how ice can become water and I remember this metaphor, just listening to both of you, that if if I was asked, what's the natural state of water? Is there a natural state? It should be ice, should be liquid, should be vapor. But if I ask myself, what is the natural state of, of, my, of me, of Alex? Which one would it be? Would be the 21-year-old version, the 40-year-old version, the 60-year-old version, hopefully, the five-year-old version, the little kid who was jumping around or just, you know, sharing a laugh or the version that is right now with you. And so for one hand, I, I see that for Shoshana, the, the flexibility of getting to know oneself and just having the opportunity to acknowledge, even though right now seems like a difficult time for, for some to, to see that doors can be opened. And on the other hand, acknowledge, as BJ said, that we are the ones who have to take the leap. We are the ones who will be in this, in this canvas painting the, the roads that we have. And that's very amazing. So personally speaking, you know, in the pandemic, right when it started, it was, I was in a position of you know, opportunity as a student to have a pause, right? And say, you know, how can I, how, how should I deal with my time here on earth? And you know, am I doing it correctly? Am I, Am I enjoying it fully? So how would you guys uh, approach, you know, this pause that we've been having, you know, on one hand, which is an opportunity, but on the other hand, I, I don't want to take the, the immense difficulties for people that we're living it. So how would you go with it? Oh, I can jump in. I, I think that's such a, it's, a, it's like the question of the times. I see existential crises all the time in, in patients, you know, people who have a diagnosis and the world's coming apart and invariably, well, I don't know if invariably, very often with enough support and some time, existential crises can be these amazing opportunities, just as you said, Alex, to revisit yourself, to look again, to think differently, to open your eyes to what you have and to take your life seriously in a way. I don't mean like with a stern face. I just more mean like, Hey, this, this is really, I'm, this is life. I'm not waiting. It's not going to happen somewhere else. This is it. So those can be, but to get there, of course, to get to that sort of openness, you got to go through some hell first, generally speaking, it, it's a very painful process and existential crises have a way of just sort of taking you down to your nub, to that core thing that I was mentioning in that letter to my younger self, that, that, that the unchangeable part, but it turns out it's, it's hard to get down to that. We've got so many layers of applique and shellac and you know things that coats and armor that we put on um it takes a while to get all that stuff off um and so i find myself especially right now i kind of there's a i want to leap to the to the lessons where we should be learning and all the sort of the if you will the silver linings and all that stuff but i i think that's actually pretty hazardous you can't it's hard to be in something and reflect on it at the same time yeah and it, it's sort of like if you're out in, a, in some beautiful place and you're just overwhelmed and it's amazing and it's surreal and it's sublime. And then you sort of try to, you reach for your camera and you want to capture it and all this stuff. Trying to capture it is can really actually pull you out of that very amazing feeling you're in. 
And so I don't want to leap to, re, to, re, to summarize or to, to pull lessons out too soon. I think we've got a lot more to feel. And I think for many of us, that's a, one of the main powers of an existential crisis that it puts you in touch with Jesus, all these feelings that you have that you've made blocked away or moved past, you glided over. So the answer to your question is, yeah, and here we are having an existential crisis en masse. And that's the opportunity because we're all, there's empathy now. Mm-hmm. Normally an existential crisis is very lonely, but right now there's a potential for us to really understand each other's crisis and therefore be empathetic and therefore appreciate each other. That's a huge opportunity for our species, for the planet, for ourselves as individuals. But like I say, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, Alex, but just to say, I don't think, I think it's hazardous to try to leap too quickly to those, the tidy um, lessons learned hmm. because we're still in the stew. So I think a lot of us should just shut up and feel it. Wow. Yes. And Shoshana, would you like to jump in? So I'll just build off of what BJ was, what BJ was saying, because I think it's right on that. Honestly, maybe this is my predisposition because I'm Jewish, but I always believe that we're in crisis anyway, that we are in a state of entropy anyway, that things are falling apart. And so to me, it feels like that has just been externalized, that this crisis is just an externalization of the crisis we've been in for so long. And In a way, this is going to sound terrible, but in a way, I'm like, finally, finally, we can see the brokenness. Everyone can see it. Mm. And like BJ said, we can join hands and think, how can we adapt around this and change our ways? Because it feels like the the 10 plagues. It feels like the frogs and the locusts and, you know, everything is crashing down on us. And misery and crisis is piling upon misery and crisis. It's very hard to get through the day without feeling the collective pain of the world because we're all reading the headlines. So even as much as people are running to the hills and, uh, you know, going camping and, 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 you know, the wealthy are fleeing the cities and droves, the fact is you can't get away from this. Mm. You, this, this one is inescapable. And there is something great about the forcing function as BJ said, of having to feel it right now, having to feel our brokenness together. And how do we adapt around that? How do we create something better? So to me, that's the meaning right now. Well, I asked my, my rabbi that if there was a version in the Torah that there was going to be a second wave of the Ten Commandments, just as you said, and <laughs> it, it really feels that way. Honestly, just the modern version, you know, the technological version of, of it all. Yeah, so feeling, and I, I'd like to, to touch upon more on empathy and, and wisdom. So the, the gem, the insight for me, just as, as, as you both were, were mentioning it, is that we can't rationalize wisdom. We have to live through it. We have to experience it. And rationalizing it, just for me asking for a recipe for you guys, how can you, we create wisdom, is, it doesn't work that way. Everyone has their own their own way of creating it. But collectively speaking, how can we all garnish this feeling into practice? How can we actually create something out of it? Well, I think we just name step one, which is actually just to be in it, be here, feel it. You know, all the discomfort, uh, all all those strange stuff that goes along with it. So I think that's really, that's, I was going to say step one. It's not so stepwise but for the purpose of conversation step one be here feel it mm-hmm. really feel it and then beyond that i think we have to have like a transitional sort of grief because like shosh and i write about and like we see anyone who's dealt with sort of end of life issues you see this, grief is a, uh, is a big important force of nature and we get ourselves in trouble if we try to short circuit it go around it so uh, feel it, grieve what's lost. And the sooner we sort of get in touch with what's lost and stop pretending that this is just another normal every another day, then we can kind of metabolize the, we can digest uh, the, what, the world that's gone and, 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 and revisit or regain or come back to what we still have because we still have a lot. And of course, there's so much more we could lose. You know, yeah. there's a lot more we could lose. So I think we've got to make some sort of peace with that 
And I think grief is the way to do that. And then as we come out the backside of that sort of transitional grief, if we do that well, then we can really with new eyes see all that we still have to work with. And then we, and then it becomes a part of sort of rebuilding and recombobulating. The opportunity is everything's broken. We have shards all over the place. Well, now we can quilt it all together differently. Yeah. But to do that, of course, you have your eyes wide open, you have to dare to learn and you have to dare to come to terms with the things that you, you don't know and don't do necessarily well. So I think the opportunity here is this, as Shosh was saying, this sort of obviousness of our limits. Humans do really, really well with limits. Give them a little time, we adapt. So feel it, grieve it, and then begin the sort of learning and collective learning and adaptation. We have a creative opportunity unlike any other I can I, I don't know when to compare it to out the backside of this um, with all this rubble to make something different that's a little bit of the way to get there and then maybe the next question is well how do we what do we want to build yeah. um, I'll just quickly say while I'm on it I think I think the major moment for the healthcare system is holy cow we really mother nature really still wins we've got we have limits. And medicine in the West doesn't like to admit that. And the public doesn't want the public doesn't want medicine to have limits. Medicine doesn't want to have limits. And so we keep kind of pretending that we can do anything. Mm-hmm. That's how we've forestalled any death conversations, how we keep bigger realities at bay until it's so late in the game. Well, now I think maybe all the sort of the ills of the healthcare system, like Shosh was saying, are being revealed. And maybe there's some relief in that. For those of us who work in the healthcare system, it's brutal trying to keep up that charade. And it's obviously a charade now. There's a lot of things that we just can't fix. And maybe one of the things we'll feel would be the ascent of palliative care, of a, of a mindset that works with things that it can't fix. Um, that would be a little bit of my dream. You know, you mentioned how nature still has the the upper hand. When I hear my family or my close relatives saying, you know, how much time until we get a vaccine, you know? Is it going to be three months, six months? And I tell them, if, it, if it's in a year, it's a miracle. If it's in a year, it do, it, this doesn't happen. This is like sci-fi reality when we're talking about a pandemic finishing in three months. I've been trying to grapple with the fact that we've tried to isolate ourselves from nature. You know, you can see our buildings and you can see the wilderness, just we're not connected to it. And this gives us an opportunity to do so. And yeah, so design wise, as you say, everything seems shattered. And one of the concepts that I've been really reading into and, and, and researching is the, the concept Japanese art named Kintsugi, right? When everything is shattered and you can create a broken pottery piece of art and with gold and create something beautiful out of it. And I really do hope that we call our healthcare workers heroes, you know, all my life and my, my son's life. So I think there's great opportunities. But Shoshana, for you, what do you think our cities, our society, the way ha- that has been built upon tells about ourselves, our relationship with nature, with life, with death, with cycles? That's a great question. Well, we know that we've become city animals. You know, we used to be a much more rural and agrarian civilization, and now everyone has flocked to cities. And it feels like we're in uh, the apex of materialism as a global culture, where what matters to us is what we consume rather than what we observe and appreciate. So you consume in the city. And you observe and appreciate nature. Yeah. And again, this is this is an inflection point. Many people are fleeing the city and going back to nature and wanting to, you know, they're like, wow, if I can work remotely, I'm going to work from that cabin in the woods and be a wall, you know, go to Walden Pond for a couple of years. And I think it's a very healthy reset. You know, we're finding again the fractures and in, in capitalist system. I mean, you know, hospitals are just one symptom of capitalism where hospitals are profit driven and they aren't designed to have any slack in the system. So we did, we, no, we didn't have the beds to, uh, you know, for a pandemic, we didn't have the, the, the infrastructure for it and we didn't have the um, human resource for it. And when you design for profit instead of for human good, you get into trouble. Our cities are designed also for profit and not necessarily for human good. 
hospitals are designed for profit and not for human, not necessarily for human good, although they do a lot of human good. Yeah. And so I think this is a very healthy reset. Maybe we should rebalance and not all be crammed into a dense city. You know, there are obviously environmental implications for that because then people are in their cars all the time. But I had the opportunity to live in Denmark um, a year ago and we didn't have a car for a year. Everyone's on bikes. That whole city is architected around human needs. And it's possible. We in America have a lot to learn. Beautiful. I just, I just want to pull out the, the thrilling piece here of, of us revisiting nature, our nature, and, and, and this weird, silly schism that we all bought into of, of, of man versus nature, mm-hmm. as though humans are somehow not part of nature. <laughs> this is just kind of a stunning design flaw. Um, and so maybe, yeah, I'd really, really like to get past that one. And that's what so much of Shosh and my work together has been about, is getting in touch with your nature, i.e. we're mortal. But really, that's that's a proxy for a bigger thing, which is revisiting nature, realizing we are part of nature. One of the, the, the big things for me, reading your book, A Beginner's Guide to the End, and, and listening to you talk has been that we've isolated ourselves into this notion that death is something we we have to we have to put in our closet and not talk about it and specifically with younger people for me this is a, a difficult topic to be very honest and i understand that for parents telling their young kids six year olds seven year olds it has to be much much more difficult for example my brother is studying psychology his master's in psychology and he said at one of his fellow classmates told a tale about uh, parents telling their young son that their grandma is sleeping and there she has to be put to sleep in a coffin you know for for existence so what happened the child doesn't sleep anymore she can't sleep she doesn't want to go to sleep she doesn't want it to happen so this notion that things don't happen or we can talk about them and it, it's it's rather strange so plenty of people are are dealing with this right now dealing with these conversations so how how can we manage in a mature way yet in a in part empathic way as you mentioned empathy how can we deal with this yeah it's a great question i think um It is a hard conversation to have, and that's why so many people use euphemisms with kids, because we think we have to protect our kids. But we write about this in the book, about the questions and how to answer them. And kids are so much more resilient than we think, so much more accepting of whatever we tell them about life than we think. And if we tell them (laughs) that death is sleep, they're sure going to be afraid of going to sleep. So we really encourage not using that kind of euphemistic language and just being direct and saying, look, grandma's body was tired and it started, it started shutting down. And this is what happens when bodies get sick and tired and she's, she's not going to breathe anymore and she's not going to be alive in the same way, but she'll always be there in your heart Hmm. and just be very matter of fact about it. And kids can really accept a lot if you, if you level with them. And if you show that, you know, you're dealing with it also in your own way, I mean, showing grief and crying about the loss in front of your kids is okay. It, grief, we, as BJ said, we are naturally selected for grief because we're naturally selected for attachment, right? As animals, when we attach, we're safer when we attach to each other. And what attachment means for us is love. You know, there's an evolutionary bias towards that. And likewise, with conversations with anyone, I think if you just acknowledge that it's hard, and yes, of course, it will be a loss. And of course, it will be, it, it may be the most difficult experience you ever go through, but it's it's a part of life. And if we don't enfold it into all of life's experience, then we're not going to have the sense of its of life's preciousness, right? The the reason life is precious is because it's finite. Wow. If it went on forever, if those moments stretched out forever, there would be no reason to invest in them. Mm-hmm. So that that's kind of the central crux of our book is look guys, we've got like five minutes here. Yeah. Let's do everything we can. 
Yes. And then prepare ourselves for the end, which is coming for all of us. I don't have much to add. I think I think what shows just laid out is is right on, and it's really hard. I think one of the things that happens. So I, I think the takeaway for me, just to sort of, um, I don't think we can all hear it enough. Which is, I think so much of the trouble is when we separate death from life, as though death robs us of life. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course. That's not quite accurate. Death is totally essential to life. It's part of the life. We get to have life because of death, et cetera. So you just can't, it, it, it's a mind bender, but it's a, it's a real one. So bend your mind. You know, so, so that's, that's a huge, huge sort of construct that we have to, I think that's what could be happening right now is we're sort of lung, clunkily folding this reality and, and expanding our, I think the math is that you, the three of us and individuals, we get to, what we need to do is expand our view of reality so that it can include things like death. Um, it's much less terrifying if it's within your life, if it's part of your deal versus this thing that's going to come get you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I just want to hearken what Shosh is saying. And that's a huge, huge deal. It's going to, that, that's going to take some work. Sometimes I don't know, Shosh, if you've had this experience, but now that Shosh and I have worked on this book and have, you know, thought about it more than the average citizen. I, I know when I talk to sometimes with patients or folks in general, um, because we've sort of broken down this subject and tried to make it practical on how to approach it and get into it, sort of like I've, I've, I've known people who said, well, I did all those things and, and I'm still sad. Like what, what gives, man? Like I thought, you know, as though somehow our, the, the, impl- the implicit pl- promise was, Oh, death is so hard and sad. But if you do these t- things, take these steps, then then it's okay. Um, yeah, sort of. I mean, the the okay part is, yeah, it's okay. You will get through it. You will. It's got to be okay because it is. You know, you and there are ways to make some sense of it. There's a process to go through, so you're not just so whipsawed. But if you somehow think that by doing the job well means you don't feel any pain. Yeah, you're, you're in for a dif- even like a bigger like disappointment. <laughs> I think the pot, the the bottom line, just like we're talking about death as part of life, sadness, sorrow, Pain. heartache, longing, that's part of the deal too. So we're not trying to lay out some way to circumvent or obviate the hard stuff. No, the whole point is the hard stuff's part of the part of the deal too. And so build your capacity rather than I think what we humans often do is we narrow our lens to make it manageable rather than get better at expanding our scope and dealing with a bigger frame. So I think, I think that's the math deal with a bigger frame, let those hard feelings in sooner you do. Then you'll also know that you're not just hard feelings. It's not just sorrow. It's not just pain. I I feel like one of the biggest misconceptions has been that the, natural state of humans has got to be happiness, only happiness. And that's, that's a good thing, right? We all want to be happy. We, we, we want to stay away from unpleasant feelings, right? But as you say, BJ, pain can be some sort of a compass that can shed a light on the things that we can work upon. And more importantly, that pain is a feeling that humans have, right? And it's, It's painful (laughs) to acknowledge pain. That sounds weird. But at the end of the day, honestly, if we conceive ourselves as as mortals and as being a young person, for me, it's difficult to acknowledge it, right? For me, it's just, you know, it's it's a topic that it shouldn't be acknowledged, but I have to be mature enough to, to, to accept it. And perhaps most important, my generation has to accept it because we have an opportunity to create meaningful change in our lives. And if we acknowledge that life's a cycle and we're five minutes here, as Shoshana said, we can pass the baton in a mature way, humbling way, and give the opportunity to my sons, which I don't have, I don't plan to have anytime soon, (laughs) to enjoy the time on earth as I have and as my grandparents have, and they inherited me that, that, that opportunity. So... We're here for a short period, yet pain can shed a beautiful light into our lives. And, you know, right now it's a collective pain. It's one that no one wants to be 
feeling yet on hindsight we will I, I'm very optimistic that we can create beauty out of it and one of the big things surrounding this conversation has been that it seems that in the United States more more specifically the society has become a lot of a, a bit atomized very individual and I took a gap year um, right before starting uh, my my undergraduate studies and I went to a kibbutz and I saw how how important it is to to be in a community right to to you know the doctor is the same as the as the landscaper or it, I, I don't mean to say it in a communist way I mean just we're a community <laughs> so how do you think we can regain the terrain of community what are the steps we can take you know for me as an individual and then you know as a family and then as a society how can we unfold as a community more and more well first i just want to say alex i think you're so much wiser than your years i'm so Thanks. impressed with you you're only 21 imagine that pj doing a podcast <laughs> I can't imagine that, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, I love that you spent a year on kibbutz and I envy that. I wish that I had had that experience because I do think that we are naturally social animals and we're meant to live in community. And yet you're right. We have become very atomized. And again, I think this is part of the greater capitalist malaise that we're living in. I There was a great article that David Brooks wrote about the failure of the nuclear family, that we mm. forced ourselves into these unnatural units of, you know, two parents and 2.5 children and the car and the suburban house. And that's not a natural way to live. You know, we, we, there are so many more dependencies that we, that we have, that we feel and that we need, you know, it, to, it really takes, it really does take more than that to raise children well. And it really does take more than that to have a healthy marriage. It takes being in a community where you have outlets and, and other voices and other people around to, to, to manage and to care. And I have to say this pandemic, one of the silver linings has been that seeing my neighborhood come to life and take care of people taking care of each other, you know, people are dropping food off of at each other's doors and, oh. um, you know, the bounty from one person's garden shows up on my doorstep and another person made these beautiful letterpress cards. My neighbor made these beautiful letterpress cards with a Cornell West quote that says, justice is what love looks like in public. Wow. <laughs> Which is so beautiful. And she just dropped these cards off at my door And I've been making homemade granola and giving it to people in the neighborhood. And there are these mutual aid networks that are, that are springing up across cities in America. And I've been a part of the one here in Berkeley. And I got matched with a 95-year-old woman named Kay. And when I called, they said, Kay, doesn't, she does her own shopping, but she just wants to have some girl talk. She wants some conversation. She's feeling lonely. And so I called Kay up. And I said, Kay, how are you doing? And she says, oh, I'm just fantastic. Every day is like Christmas. It's like Santa comes to my door every day. And I said, are you living in the same reality as the rest of us are, Kay? She said, well, I'll just tell you, I got the most perfect sandwich today for lunch. And it wasn't what was in the middle. It was the bread. Shoshana, the bread was just gorgeous. And she was just waxing on and on about the simple pleasures of her day, mm -hmm. the bread in her sandwich and the fact that her neighbor came and visited her for an hour and that she is remembering being a child and growing up in South side of Chicago and, and going to Catholic school and how, how harsh the nuns with her. She's having all these memories of childhood. And I thought to myself, how is it that this 95 year old woman who is living alone and, you know, is probably quite limited, feels like she's in her glory days. And it was such a reminder to me that it's all in how you see it, right? And, you know, for me to get jacked out of my misery as a middle-aged woman in the middle of a pandemic and hear this 95-year-old woman delight in life like that, 
Mm-hmm. That is that is the gift of community. That's the gift of getting outside of yourself and doing service and seeing other people and realizing that you're not the only poor soul in the world and that there's a, a much bigger community out there and that you should be in it. But it's easy to get trapped inside your own head. So I, I think, again, this is a forcing function that is breaking us out of that individualism and, and forcing us back into community. Yes, BJ, I would love to hear what you have in mind. Yeah, I think um, this individual thing, this autonomy thing, it's great. Like a lot of things like independence, um, these are all ideals or objectivity. These are all, you can aspire towards them. I think we just need to get clear our teachers need to do a better job. We as parents, we just need to do a better job of saying you're never going to autonomy is a, it may be a compelling force to, 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 to push you, but it, it's, it's not possible. Like you're never, you're never going to be fully autonomous. They never say that last little part. And so a lot of us waste tons of time trying to be independent when that's all we can only ever relatively be. So, so I guess my, where I'm going with this is just to pick up on what Shosha is saying. Yes. I, I think, this is our social nature is just a fact. So I think really what we're saying here is just, this is a process. Like we just need to be more honest with ourselves. Like (laughs) we should, none of us should be surprised that we need other human beings. Um, And yet plenty of us would be surprised by that. We wouldn't, Oh, we wouldn't own that. Um, Somehow we think of that as weakness. So part of the shift that needs to happen here is, 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 I think we all have to sort of realize the link between strength and vulnerability and be honest with ourselves to get there. It's not a, it's not a weakness to need each other. And maybe just by, it's sort of, I learned that by becoming, you know, disabled. I learned that being in a hospital, being so, ba- so, so dependent on others um, in a, in a way I couldn't ignore. And then I, then I could just look around and say, I'd always been dependent. You know, it was just a dramatic example that just, forced its way into my eyeballs and so that could happen right now for all of us it's it's always been so but now maybe we can be honest about that so yeah to me this is this is about honesty and then i would say one more thing about that another thing that shosh picked up uh, i was put pulling up was it's not just about accepting all it's not we're like passive creatures that we have no agency or no control um it's just we have a much more dynamic nature a a relationship to control we are being controlled we control we have it's not it's just not so monolithic um and where we have where we where anybody has agency is in their perspective and how they see things that is for my money the single greatest human trait we can change how we see things Mm. and that's the way we can change the world that's the way we can change ourselves is how we see ourselves how we see things and and I, I just I get very excited about that creative enterprise that we humans have access to, um, but that's if you want to if you're if you're a control freak you know if your thing is control, <laughs> go point it there. Um, that that's real. That's honest. Um, For me, as I, just your, your finishing remarks, uh, as BJ's BJ's finishing remarks were, were that being control freaks is one of the. <laughs> most difficult things that can happen during a pandemic, right? And if I showed you pictures of me at the start of the pandemic, you would see this guy's a psycho. He was wearing, I was wearing everything I could to protect myself. So I would jump in that, in that category. And it has shed a light on how much dependency I need to control things. And as I said, reading the beginner's guide to the end and listening to both of you talk is, is difficult to me. Yet it is important because one of the things we, I, I include most humans, but for personally me is our, my own mortality, right? It's the one thing I can't control and yet it's going to happen. But what about being there for others? You know, I've been, I've been to, to many shivas and I've, I've seen mourning and grieving and one of the biggest challenges uh, what, what i was getting into was you know dealing with what with one's mortality with my mortality but how can we be there for others what's the best way to 
I, I sometimes feel the urge to say something, necessary thing, just to, to show them that I'm there. How would, you, how would you do that? Or what's the best way, given your experiences? Yeah, and we, t we talk a little bit about this in the book. There, it's, it's really hard. I mean, this is where words, for my money anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very suspicious of words. They, only, they, this, they have so much power. They get all the attention. Um, and so there's all this pressure for us to find the right words and maybe, and sometimes the right words are out there. Um, but it's always subjective and it's always contextual. And what I could say in, in one culture, one, one family, it might be just the perfect thing for me to say to you, Alex, I'm so sorry for your loss or whatever, you know, something, just pick a phrase. Other families would just, other people might hear that as trite, Pat, you're sorry. What does that mean? You didn't do anything. What are you sorry? Well, I don't know. You people could kind of lay into that in all sorts of ways. So the, the, I guess my point is there is no perfect thing to say. Hmm. Um, I still think there are things to say and there are certainly things to do, but for, for what I think, I think the best advice I can give to your question, Alex, is that what really registers with folks when they're in free fall amidst their own loss is feeling with them and just, sh just finding some way to show that you are feeling empathy. You're feeling pain too. It hurts hurting you. You're here, you're with them. You're experiencing this on some very basic level. You don't need to demonstrate it necessarily or take all the spotlight on yourself. Hey, look, I'm suffering too. You don't, you know, it's not a, not a competition, yeah. but if we all get a little bit better at um, revealing ourselves in our daily lives and not puffing up and not putting on airs, you know how it is when you're around someone who's just themselves, there's not, you might not be able to put your finger on what it is that they do. It's just, there's, there's an, there's an authenticity There's probably a chemical reaction. We probably smell different when we're doing that. You know, who knows, whatever, but you can feel it. Mm -hmm. So I guess my advice here is um, dare to feel with somebody. And I will sometimes say, as often as I've been around this, I will just, I'll just own the, I don't really have, I don't know what to say. You know, I'll say things. I, I just don't know what to say. Words escape me, but, and I, you know, just, and I'll be awkward and, and goofy and just, but real. And I feel like that at the, as a bottom line is the right bottom line rather than trying to find just the right word. because I think that's a, that you could chase your tail forever. Mm -hmm. I think the bottom line is dare to be real, whatever the heck that is. Yes, definitely. And as, as I said, it is, it has become like a necessary thing to do, right? To say, say things when mm -hmm. trying to say things just to say things because it has become a, a routine yeah. takes away the, the the importance and the, the immensity of it, you know. So, mm -hmm. just trying to feel things in a superficial way. Just, I I often like to see those who just hug you for five minutes or three minutes or just stand beside you or help with the dishes while while it's the shiva or help the 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 guests that come. So going back to 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 your point about community church before is there a way to regain faith in communities or well i think you know we have a, a faith tradition which has tried to bring us community and architect community for us um you know that's part of what faith and, and religion is is it's a, a community bound by a certain book or a certain belief system And that can be very comforting when you experience a loss to fall back into that community. I know for me, it was the way I connected with my father. Part of the way I connected with him was through his faith and his, his strong observance of Judaism and, and being in synagogue with him on the high holidays and feeling him reach his most spiritual and kind of, um, out of out of head out of body self because he was a professor he was very intellectual so seeing him pray and daven and be and sing was maybe the only time that i saw him kind of get out of that intellectual mode and when that opens up that's a that's a that's a gate of heaven that's opening up when someone sings and prays and And so I felt very connected to him, standing by him there. And so for me to go back 
and feel him in the room, feel his presence. And that was very powerful for me and it's still powerful for me. And so that can be a real girding, I think, for people when they f- are feeling the loss of someone they love, if that, if that was a way that they connected. You know, I think what, what BJ said was, is so profound, just daring to feel. That to me is it. That's it. Daring to feel. Just, and as you say, Alex, just giving someone a hug and standing next to them and remaining open and listening. It's so much more about just listening than having something to say. Oh. Um, so, you know, I remember when we had Shiva for my father, when I opened the door and someone walked in and I could feel the empathy on their face when they looked at me and said, I understand how heartbroken you are. They didn't say anything just on their face. I could see it. That was all I needed. That was all I needed. So daring to feel, I would let BJ's words just close us out. I can't believe it. We're one hour in. It's it flew by. One of the mind bending things is how can we create time, you know, and be aware of time, and then time doesn't exist. And right now, speaking with you two has has given me that amazing feeling because even though we're not together, I feel closeness. You know, your words, your your book, your experiences really do resonate with me and give me a chance to look into who I want to become and, and how can I become my best self with others, with nature, with my own mortality and my control freakness. <laughs> But yeah, so BJ Shoshana, thank you so much. Is there anything that I didn't touch on that you would like to add just before we wrap up? Oh, we love you, Alex. How's that for an end? <laughs> wow. It's really sweet being with you, man. Super sweet. For the future. Yeah. Sweet. And thank you for being so persistent and coming to get us. Well, yeah. Thank you for, for uh, coping with my, with my insistence. Really. Thanks. And hopefully we can see in person, you know, if, if Mother Nature gives us a time to, to start again, I will be glad to, to start with you guys and we'll mm. keep in touch. Sounds, Sounds great. great. Thanks for tuning in for this edition of Through Conversations Podcast. If you find this episode interesting, don't miss out on new conversations and subscribe to the podcast at any podcast feed you use and leave me a review. Also, consider sharing it with someone you think can enjoy this episode. Our new awesome music is by Joe Lyle. More info can be found at joelyledrums.com. Hosted and produced by Alex Levy.